in the interest of full disclosure, when I finished these notes, I thought, you know, I did a remarkable job of taking a pretty simple concept and making it very complex. Um, because um, I'm not really following any pattern per se, and when I finish with the notes, they just, they're finished, you know, that's just how it works. And so when these finished, I looked down and said, what page am I on? Maybe I got, maybe I got to page three, I'm not sure, and sure enough, I was on page five. So um, we may or may not cover everything that's on your page. The premise here is, is actually not a very difficult one. But what I want to do is, if I don't cover certain things, I wanted you to have verses to look at. I want you to have some of those concepts and statements in front of you. Um, there are not a lot of blanks to fill in. But what, what I want to do tonight and spend a little maybe extra time on is I want to talk about some of the, dis, the distinctive views on sanctification that Christians hold. If we look at the theme of sanctification as a whole, um, every major Protestant denomination holds the basics to be true in, in the same sort of way. Um, those basic principles we would, we would agree on. But there are some specifics in how sanctification happens and plays out that we disagree on, and those disagreements can be fairly significant. And there's not much more important in your daily life after becoming a Christian than sanctification. Um, there's a statement having your note somewhere that really a majority of New Testament texts that are aimed at believers are about this subject. What does it mean to be like, like Christ, to grow up in, in, in Christ? So we'll come to that in just a little bit. So I'm going to hit some of the things I think are basic, maybe rather quickly. If I miss something that's in your notes or you, you've got a question, please, I'll put the burden on you to stop me and raise your hand or ask a question. Otherwise, I'll, I'll kind of go through quickly because there are, there are a lot of notes. I want to start with this verse, and I'm not going to give much explanation to it because I'm going to spend a little time on it towards the end and show you how this really is a good summary of what I believe the Bible teaches us regarding sanctification. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And I want you to see both of those components. So just store that away. When Paul writes to the Philippians, work out your salvation, he's not saying work for your salvation. He's not saying here's the means by which you can earn God's approval, that you can earn justification. He's saying the implications of your salvation, what it means now to be in Christ, and what you do because you're in Christ, that's something you have to work out. But there's a promise, God is working in you. So remember those two concepts, we'll come back to that in a little bit. What do we mean by sanctification? I took this definition because I, I read so many, I thought this was the best succinct one. From the Westminster Shorter Catechism, sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man or whole person after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Key components in that? like every other part of our salvation, it is a work of God's grace. God is doing something in us. God works in us by His goodness, by His mercy, by His power. He, he affords this to us. And the effect is Christ-likeness. This is from our own confession of faith, New Hampshire Confession, in the section um, number 10, entitled Of Sanctification. We believe that sanctification, and circle the key words here, is the process by which, according to the will of God, we are made partakers in His holiness, that it is a progressive work, that it is begun in regeneration, and that it is carried on in the hearts of believers by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, the sealer and the comforter, in the continual use of the appointed means. That's a key word. Especially the Word of God, self-examination, self-denial, watchfulness, and prayer. And truthfully, I could teach really all the important concepts of sanctification from that one statement of faith. That this is something that God's will um, is clear on, which God wills for all of His, all of His own. The point and purpose of it is that we become like Jesus, partakers in holiness, that it's progressive, it should be growing. Those who are in Christ should becoming, be becoming more and more like Christ. And God's Holy Spirit is the primary cause but not the only cause. God uses the means that He has appointed to make us more and more like Christ. Does that make sense? I mean, we understand this. How do we become more like Jesus? Well, we do. there are a number of things we could do. 
We can make a list of these things. We listen and respond to sermons that we hear. We engage in personal and group Bible study. We have accountability with other believers. Uh, God sanctifies us sometimes through, through discipline when we sin. And there are many different factors that accompany us, all the means that God chooses. Sanctification is closely and inseparably related to justification. Remember, we talked about justification in the, in the legal sense. We're made right before God. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you were justified so that now you've been granted this, this legal standing. It's courtroom language. You've been declared right with God because you've received the righteousness of Christ and Christ has taken all of your unrighteousness on Himself. In justification, God declares repentant sinners righteous. But in sanctification, this is why I say they're so closely related and separately related. In one, we're declared righteous. In one, God is actually making us righteous. He's making it so. Does that make sense for everybody? So again, if I mean, you could have a whole lot of issues to still be working out in your life. You could have a whole lot of hang-ups and problems and sinful behaviors and attitudes and things when you came to Christ and not even knowing all the things that you've got to repent of and work through. You're still declared righteous in Christ at that moment. But from that point forward, that which God has declared in you, He's making it absolutely so. It's going to be actual in us. So in justification, we're holy in principle. So we would say this, this is positional righteousness. We're positionally sanctified. But in sanctification, God makes us holy and godly in practice. That's the difference. So we're experientially sanctified in our words and deeds. Um, here's a relationship of that to the book that we're in right now on Sunday mornings in Matthew. Um, I, I address this a little bit in Sunday's message. I'll be hitting it more in the weeks to come. The righteousness that we see Jesus speaking of in the Sermon on the Mount is almost always practical, actual righteousness. When He's calling people to righteous living, He's not simply saying, put your faith in Me, I'll forgive your sins, and you'll be declared righteous. He's talking about how you actually live. What does it mean to live in this kingdom, this new kingdom? You've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Jesus is now the king, so what does it mean to live as a member of God's kingdom with Jesus as your king? So it's practical righteousness. And here's a key element too. Maybe th these are some you might want to asterisk or circle because they're sort of the foundational ones. Sanctification is as certain as all the other parts of our salvation. They're, they're certain. Here's a key passage. We've hit this one a few times already. Romans chapter 8, 28 through 30. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to its purpose. Okay, That's a favorite verse of a lot of people. All things work together for good. Okay. How do we know that? How do you know that in your life, with all of his issues, pains and struggles and difficulties, with your failures and sins and, and missteps and all the things that could have you, how do you know that this is true? Because of this. For. That's a huge for. That's a huge because of verse 29. Those whom he foreknew... We know biblically from Ephesians chapter 1 that foreknowledge of God is before time began. That's not just before you were born. It's way before you were born. Those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's sanctification. Those that He foreknew, He predestined. He, he predetermined that what would happen to those that He foreknew? They would be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. So again, key phrase there, He also, He also. So it starts at this beginning point, before time began. God in His infinite wisdom and absolute grace foreknows a people. At the other end of that spectrum, those that God foreknew will be safely, effectively delivered into eternity. In His hands, they will be glorified. And in between, we know the parts and, uh, of that process. Um, we won't look at these necessarily as sequential things that are happening. They're all components of how God works in saving us. He's calling us. He's regenerating us. He's justifying us. He's sanctifying us. He's glorifying us. Um, this is a bit of an old source, but it gives you a good overview. Uh, Thomas Watson is one of my favorite old Puritan writers. Thomas Watson, in his book, A Body of Divinity... There's you want, and I think this one, if, for those of you who want to read old things, and it's always great to read the old classics, I believe this one you can find free online. But um, A Body of Divinity, he gives six reasons why sanctification is necessary, why it has to happen. Let me run through them really quickly. First one is this, God has called us to this. 
This is clearly the revealed will of God for His people, sanctification. 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Well, when it comes to sanctification, part of that is learning. Now, that, that's part of you becoming more like Christ. It's, there's, a, there's a mental component here, the knowledge, the learning. There are certain things that you've got to understand, right? You're, that's, that's one of the reasons you're in this class. You're trying to, are there some things I need to bone up on or shore up my understanding of or some things I need to discover? That's part of our sanctification is learning, always learning, and I hope you'll always be doing that. But our, our faith is not primarily academic, you know, this, this has to be experienced. This has to be lived out. The, the evidence that I'm truly in Christ is not just my ability to pass a theological exam. It's how much I love the Lord and how much I love people. To love the Lord my God with all my heart and to love my neighbor as myself are, are much better evidences of true Christianity than just the knowledge I have. But there's knowledge of it. But God has called us to this. This is the will of God, your sanctification. And when we say will of God, this is a will of decree of God. Maybe you can write that on the side. This is not just the preferred will of God. You know, we know that it's God's will that you should abstain from sexual sin, the Bible teaches. You should abstain from fornication. That's the will of God. But people don't. Not everyone does. But there are some aspects of God's will that He absolutely determines and decrees, and sanctification is one of those for His people. This is a will of God. God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. It would be as... As Watson says, and I'm paraphrasing, it would be utterly incongruent for God to give new life to a people, justify them and forgive their sins, and not make them pure. It would, would not make sense. It, it, does it, it's, it would be as if the whole uh, process and picture of salvation breaks down at the critical juncture because God is preparing us for Himself. He's preparing us for eternity. He's preparing us for glory. And to do that, because God is holy, he must make for himself a people who are holy. Number two, let me go faster. Without sanctification, there's no evidence of our justification. No evidencing our justification. I've referenced this passage a few more times in the notes, but 1 Corinthians 6.11 is a great one. In, in the context, um, he's describing the life of sin that many of the people in that congregation once lived. This is who you used to be. You once were. And you can see that list through the several verses that preceded 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were this, and now you're this. That, that change, that, that transition from the old to the new, the evidence of that change, that's a mark that you actually are in Christ, that you've been justified, you've been forgiven. Number three, without sanctification, we have no title to the new covenant. And we, we talk about the Bible in two halves, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. What is this New Covenant that we have in Christ? Well, obviously we know what Jesus did for us, but what did Jesus promise to us as part of that New Covenant? Well, that New Covenant included these promises from the Old Testament. Ezekiel 36, for example, verse 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart. You know, we talked about this in regeneration. Promise of God in salvation is that He will actually change you. He changed you from the inside out. You want new things. You stop wanting the old things or new desires. A new heart is there. A new willingness to be obedient to God. And God frees our will from its captivity to sin. And a new ability to do what's pleasing to God because we're no longer slaves of sin anymore, but we're slaves of righteousness. I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit I'll put within you, and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh, give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Does that make sense to everybody? I feel like I'm flying through stuff that really is like really critical kind of theology stuff here. It's the mark of what a Christian is. I'm new from the inside out. It's like what I talked about on Sunday morning. What does God care most about? Not just that here's a list of rules. Maybe there's a, a God-given rule at the center, and then maybe there are a hundred rules um, attached to that that are all sort of related to that. You know, like we talked about with the Pharisee view, or a, even today a, a Hasidic or... Um, ultra-Orthodox view of, of the Sabbath day. It's not just enough to have this sense of honoring God on this day for worship, etc., honor the Sabbath day. It means I can only take this many steps. 
It, it means when I go to my refrigerator, I can only get out enough that I can swallow in one swallow. It means if I'm going to cook a meal, I can't do it by hand um, on my cooktop with a stove, with a, with a spatula, but I can use a crock pot to do it. I always thought it was interesting when we go to Israel and you're having, you know, when, when it's Sabbath, you know you're going to get a lousy meal because they're not cooking, right? You, keep, you know, you've been there. But then you find all the, at the buffet, it's all crock pots. I mean, you see what I'm saying? It's like letter of the law, spirit of the law. I, I can't cook in a pan. I can cook in a crock pot. So here's your stew, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the new covenant says a new heart that causes us to walk in His statutes. Number four, there's no heaven without sanctification. Note to yourself on this, just in case what I say is unclear, you can make it clear for yourself for future reference. I'm not saying that we're saved with some sort of conditions attached, like, okay, here's what I'll do for you. I'll save you if you keep doing this, and if you promise to do this, and if you grow in your ability to do this. I'm saying that sanctification is the necessary prerequisite to enter into God's heaven. Again, the principle is pretty simple. I didn't go in depth in this in your notes, but if I was going to do a deep dive in sanctification, I would start in the Old Testament, and I would start with the revelation of the very character and nature of God. God is holy. And then think about all the downstream implications of God's holiness. That holiness means more than that God is just separate from us or distinct from us. It includes things like God's perfect moral character, that in Him is nothing but good, everything that's true, everything that's right, and what are the implications of God's moral character? Then He's going to judge sin. He has to, or else He's immoral. He's unjust. And so you start with this picture of the holiness of God and all the implications of what it means for God to be holy. Well, how can we possibly imagine them being in a holy God's presence corrupted by sin? We can't be. There will be no sin there. So there has to be sanctification to get us there. So we'll come to that in just a moment. Um, without sanctification, no one will see the Lord, Hebrews 12, 14. Um, your ESV version, if you use that, says without holiness. Um, legacy standard says sanctification. The concept there is sanctification. And again, the same thing is taught in the Westminster Confession of Faith. They who were once effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified, really and personally, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by His Word and Spirit dwelling in them, the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened, mortified, means put to death, and they're more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What is he saying in simplest of terms? Our sanctification has a negative uh, connotation, a positive one. In the negative, it's, it's the death of all the old things in my life that don't honor God. In the positive, it's the growing, the development, not just the birth of in my new regeneration, but the development of all those things that do honor God. Number five, without sanctification, all our holy things are defiled. I want to explain. I, I didn't make this one up, okay? So this comes from Thomas Watson. So the language is a little old. He writes this. He says, a foul stomach turns the best food into ill humors, i.e. indigestion or illness. So an unsanctified heart pollutes prayers, alms, sacrifice sacraments. If you've ever been really sick on your stomach, then you know even the best things, when they hit that, they become foul real fast. I know that from experience. Well, <laughs> here's such a challenging verse. Man, when we get to this, this is going to be a tough one. Matthew 7, 21, 20 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, who does? Who, enters, who does enter the kingdom of heaven? The one who do the will of, of God, who's in heaven. Now, again, it's not saying you earn your way into heaven. It's saying Listen, you can give lip service to this. You can claim to be something that you're not, but the evidence of it will show up. You'll do the will of, will of the Father. Um, number six, without sanctification, we have no assurance of our election. Again, if the foreknowledge of God is the language of election, the beginning of God's sovereign work in us, then remember that the evidence that it really has happened is sanctification. I mean, I, you know, again, I, I told you guys when we were talking about election, when you stand before God in heaven, the question is not, are you elect? The question is, are you redeemed? Are you regenerated? Are you justified? Do you have a new life? But what gives me evidence that those things are true of me? Sanctification. We ought always give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. 
And this is his quote on page 245. Election is the cause of our salvation. Sanctification is the evidence. It's the earmark of Christ's elect sheep. Questions on that? That's the nuts and bolts. Let me hit some of these questions. May not have ever considered. They may not mean much for you, but I think that might be helpful in understanding it. Sometimes knowing what something isn't helps you understand what something is. We talk about sanctification historically, and I'm talking about Protestants since the Reformation, evangelicals, those who believe in Jesus as the only means of salvation, people who claim Scripture as their authority and guide, have deviated some on some particulars about sanctification. Now, what I've shared with you so far, I think we would agree on. If you were Lutheran or Presbyterian or or Methodist or had a Pentecostal background, those basic things I've shared about sanctification so far, we'd be in agreement on. But here's where some of those distinctions, some forks in the road begin to happen. Let's start with Martin Luther and the Lutherans. And forgive me if any of you are Lutheran scholars or Pentecostal scholars or Methodist scholars, I'm giving you the simplified version of these things because we would be here for a long time in deep weeds. So Luther is famous for saying this phrase in Latin, um, simul justice et peccator. And the meaning of that is that we are simultaneously sinners and saints. We are simultaneously justified but sinners. Is he right? Well, we know in practical terms, yeah, he is right. We are. I mean, this is, this is the, the already but not yet stage of us. I mean, we're already pronounced righteous. We know that. We already have that, that principle of righteousness applied to us, but we still sin, right? Everybody agree? So, you know, it's a both and. We're not fully sanctified yet. And I, I have more than skepticism when someone tells me, I don't sin anymore. I was listening to somebody, somebody sent me a clip of a preacher saying that he just doesn't sin anymore. I, I don't believe that to be true. Uh, I think you have a, a, a poor understanding of what sin is if that's the case. Um, so he's right, but in their process of understanding sanctification, Lutheran understanding essentially is this. All of this righteousness that God requires of us is fully of grace. In, in other words, we're constantly in a state of, I'm a sinner, and the only righteousness I'm ever going to have is the righteousness of God's grace. So He forgives me, so I'm constantly being forgiven. And real change doesn't really happen. I am forever in that stage. In fact, if I think I'm becoming more and more godly, more and more righteous, that probably is a sin of pride happening there. Is real change possible? So I think we would, we would disagree there. What about John Wesley? Uh, when I say John Wesley, I, again, one of these days we'll do church history. So when I think about John Wesley, I want you to think about the roots of Methodism, not modern Methodism, which in a lot of ways has, has jumped the shark, gone off the cliff, way past the guardrails. Um, but John Wesley had um, a theology of sanctification that um, he, would, he called entire sanctification. It, it was the idea that as a Christian, you can get to the point where you no longer sin. Uh, and that's the aim. In this life, right here, right now, that you're not going to sin, entire sanctification. And for, you may have heard the term um, holiness movement or Wesleyan holiness movement. So for those in the holiness movement that came out of Wesleyanism, there was that belief that you get to the stage of now you're just not sinning anymore, you reach that level, and that was called the second blessing. You're, you're operating at this stage, but when you really get to the point of spiritual maturity and growth and health, you receive that second blessing, and that second blessing leads to sinlessness. Okay? Any of you ever heard of Keswick theology? If you've never heard the name, I bet you heard the philosophy. You ever heard anybody say or seen a bumper sticker that says, let go and let God? Okay, Keswick theology was this. The belief of, of the Keswick movement, and this has influenced a lot of churches and denominations, is that sanctification is entirely a work of God. It's not, you don't have any part in it. You're along for the ride. But when it comes to being sanctified, let go and let God. God will do in you what God intends to do. God will create in you what He intends to create. God will remove from you what He intends to remove. God alone sanctifies you. Let go. It's a very passive approach to sanctification. Is that true? No, I don't think the Bible says so, and I'll show you in a moment. What about Pentecostal theology? There are many different aspects of Pentecostal theology, and this is one of them with which we would disagree. In Pentecostal theology, the key to being sanctified is to receive a second baptism in the Holy Spirit after you got saved. Now, if you remember when we were talking about regeneration, the act of being saved, being given new life, being born again, that's an act of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, none of us 
are in Christ. He births the new life in us. When Pentecostal theology, that's an initial stage of spiritual life. But then when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, that subsequent baptism in the Holy Spirit now is what enables you to live godly life. So if you haven't had that baptism yet, you're probably not probably not doing great at your sanctification. In fact, in some of your conversations, if you've got Pentecostal friends, they may ask you, um, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet? You ever had that conversation? Have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet? I had friends who were Pentecostal ministers, and I mean, invariably that question's coming up. That's their evangelism, in, in a sense. They're, they'll proselyte for that. Have you had received? And it's a measurement. Have I received that spirituality? Is that what the Bible teaches? So then some questions related to those. Is sanctification entirely a work of God? Is it primarily the work of our own? Or is it a joint effort? Is it synergistic? And if I am responsible, what's my role? What's God's role? Some other questions, which I think I've answered to a degree already, I will in just a sec. Is sanctification instantaneous? I think you know the answer to this, because we're not sanctified yet. Or is there a lengthy process and it's bumpy? The answer is the latter. Can sanctification be brought to completion in this life? I don't think so. I'll tell you why in just a moment. But if we have to be sanctified, if we have to be made holy to get into heaven, when will we be fully sanctified? When will that happen? All right. This is the last technical part, I promise. So I'm going to do this part quickly. There are three categories of sanctification. I'm not going to read all the verses there. I, I printed them out in full, and I think you'll get the sense of it. I'm not skipping the importance of the text, but I, I want you to get just these concepts as a precursor to the rest. Okay, when we talk about sanctification, we're talking about three parts, okay? So let's use the technical terms. First of all, there's definitive sanctification, initial sanctification. That's what I've been talking about um, that happens in justification. In fact, that would be a synonymous term with justification, really. So we're talking about now, when you see those scriptures that speak in the present tense, you're already sanctified because of what God has done for you in Christ. You've been set apart. You've been given a positional holiness. You stand right before God. So again, some of these verses we've looked at. Because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. And again, the verse I read, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Such were some of you, you were washed. Um, what is the picture of our sanctification, this new life? Baptism. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. And because one of the reasons we know that this is not... Um, a practical or um, actual sanctification, but it's a positional one, is look at the, the order. Uh, you would never have sanctification before justification. Now, this is all talking about one thing. You know, you're washed, you were sanctified, you're justified. That's that initial sanctification. Does that make sense? Because there's no way this, the language would make any sense if you're sanctified and then you get justified. That's not what happens here. So we've been sanctified, the Bible says in Hebrews 10.10, 10, through the offering of the body of Christ. Once and for all, Jesus' death and resurrection sanctified us. Verse 14, by a single offering, He's perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So it's both. We've been sanctified, we're being sanctified. Does that make sense? Definitive. That's that position I talked about at the beginning. Number two, progressive. Here's the answer to the question. Is it instantaneous? No, it's progressive. Progressive is a process by which we're growing gradually into the likeness of Christ. And I just pulled out a snippet of verses that speak of, and again, I just put a simple statement at the end. A majority of New Testament texts are about our sanctification, the call to live a godly life, the responsibility to, to do these things. What should you be doing? What should you be adding to your life? How should you be growing? I mean, again, maybe the clearest passage of this is, in a simple way, is Romans 12.1. Present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable act of worship. It's your sanctification. God, you have me. You have all of me. What do you want from me? How do you want me to live? And then you see some specifics, like in 1 Peter 1, 5 through 11. Add to these things. Make every effort. Add virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness. Do you see that? That's, that's progressive sanctification. I, I ought to be growing in all of these things. And when you come back to that, that first question, is this something God does? Or is this something I do? Or is this something we do together that God works in me to do? Well, the answer is yes. It's the third. Make every effort. But who gives you a desire to make those efforts? And who gives you the ability to succeed at those efforts? Well, that's, that's God. Questions? All right, so here's the part you're waiting for. Final sanctification. The Bible does teach a final sanctification. I don't think Wesley was that far off 
But the idea that I'm going to reach this sort of sinless perfectionism in this second blessing stage is not what the Bible teaches. But it does teach there will be a time of final sanctification. So again, here's where we are. Believers are initially definitively sanctified when you're converted. You're pursuing progressive sanctification. You know, that's growing throughout your life. But there's a final sanctification. And the word I put in here, um, eschatological. When we say eschatological, we're talking about pertaining to the end time, the future days. Specifically, we're talking about the final consummation of our sanctification, that final sanctification that becomes a reality at, anybody know? The second coming. The second coming. When Christ returns, sanctification is the result. I mean, this is, again, a lot of verses here. Let me hit a few of them. Beloved, we are God's children now. You are now. If you're a Christian now, that's, that's definitive sanctification. You're there now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself, even as He is pure. I mean, again, you see the synergy in that? When He appears, we will be like Him. He's going to do a work, that final act of sanctification. But knowing that that's coming, knowing that that's the end result of my life, what am I doing? I'm purifying myself. I mean, I'm, I'm working towards purity. I'm working towards holiness. Does that make sense? Right, clear on that? Nod your head if you're with me. I would answer that, but then you won't have reason to come back in two weeks for my very last one. <laughs> yes, it, it ends in this sense. This is the necessary precursor to glorification. Because what we'll talk about in glorification, here's the thumbnail sketch of that, is what does God give us in glorification? This is the new body. This is, you know, this is the blessings of eternity. This is, this is our eternal fellowship with Him. That's the glorification. This is the means to that. So, again, think about in, in, in kind of broad terms. In the Old Testament, you could not enter into a certain place in the tabernacle or the temple. There was a holy of holies, and there was the most holy, the holy place and the most holy place. You couldn't go in there. And the most holy place, only the high priest could go in, and then only one day a year on the Day of Atonement, marking he's been made holy by the act of this atonement, this sacrifice. Um, in the Old Testament, you see these terms, Jerusalem is the holy city. We see God's holy mountain, Sinai, all these places that you can't approach because God is holy there. In the New Testament, the New Covenant, we have access to the holy of holies, through Christ who makes us holy. So that's our positional righteousness. But yet at the same time, He's preparing us for eternity. And He's... So look at the next verse, and I think maybe it kind of answers that. Um, this is 1 Thessalonians 3.11. No, let me back. Yeah, no, that's it. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, all of His things. At that spot, at that moment. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, May the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it all, it's, it's eschatological. There's some way, it's somehow, at that moment, God finishes it. This is it. Sin is removed. You will not go into heaven with the remnants of sin. You will not be carrying that sin, that tattered garment of sin with you. So the picture here, I think, that the Bible gives that's most poignant for us is a picture of Jesus and His bride. When you become a Christian, you become part of the bride of Christ. That's called the church. The promises of Scripture is that Jesus is going to prepare for Himself a bride, a pure and, and, and ready bride to enjoy Him forever and eternity. That's the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's our great eternal celebration. This is a picture that we have of marriage in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So at that moment, that, that consummation of sense will be without blemish. Um, so that's the picture, final. So there's initial, definitive, there's progressive, process God's working in us now, and the return of Christ, it will be final. And He will deliver up for all eternity a beautiful bride, a spotless, flawless bride. So quickly, I'm going to give you just quick sort of as a summary here in the last few minutes I have. All right, we started this whole study on 
soteriology with the idea of union with Christ. And the basic premise was this, when you're in Christ, and that's the term that Paul uses more than any other to describe what a Christian is in Christ, when you're in Christ, you receive all the benefits of that relationship, of being in Christ, that union, that connection with Christ. We see some more teaching on this, particularly in Paul's theology of, of sanctification, Galatians and Romans particularly. When we're in Christ, our lives are fundamentally changed. And the term for that, Paul says, is crucified. I, I've been crucified with Christ, he says in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. But the life I, I live, I live by faith in, in, in Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. This old me is gone. Um, Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. This is what union with Christ is. I can't be in Christ and still be the same person I was. Paul said this in Romans chapter 6 with this argument about, okay, so... If I've received forgiveness, if I've received God's grace, and I'm covered, I'm good, I've been pronounced righteous, I can do whatever I want now because grace, right? That's the argument of Romans 6. And so what's Paul's answer to that? How can we, who died to sin, still live in it? Being in Christ necessarily means I've been crucified with Christ, I've died with Christ. How shall we, who died to sin, still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What's the negative way of expressing that? His death. His, my old self is crucified, dead, buried. What's the positive way of saying that? But a new me. If he was in Christ, he's a new creation. Paul says to, to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, been crucified. All things have become new. It's this new resurrection life that I have that allows me to walk in new life. If we've been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so we would no longer be enslaved to sin. This is what it means to be in Christ. All of me, in Christ, old me, Dead to sin because of Christ. Crucified with Christ. A new me because of the resurrection of Christ. I'm in Christ now. I share in the benefits of His death, which conquers my sin and my old life and my slavery to that old life. And I am united with Him in His resurrection because that's the means to walking a new life. So again, you've got both. You've got the crucified old at the top and this new life, a resurrection life has emerged. What drives my sanctification then? Again, I told you, I told you guys at the beginning, I warned you. I took something that's fairly simple and made it unnecessarily complex. What drives this new? What drives sanctification? Because I'm new. I, I've been made new. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not everything I'm going to be, but I'm not at all what I used to be. What's the fuel of this new life? The work of Christ in me, the resurrection. So what do I do as a result? Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So again, I guess in most... Simple terms, here's the reality. This is what God has done. Spiritually speaking, you've been united with Christ in His death and resurrection. You partake in both. Old you, crucified and buried. The new you emerging. You have new life in Christ. You're a, a beneficiary. You're a recipient of that second covenant, the new covenant. You have a new heart. So because this is who you are, what do I do? It makes the argument really posed to Paul preposterous. How can I live that way? I'm not that person anymore. I'm a new person in Christ. So... Here's what He's done for me. This is the work of God. This is what I've received, the work of God's grace. My responsibility in that, I consider myself dead to sin. That's not who I am anymore. I consider myself alive to God, alive to His righteousness. And so I won't let sin rule over me anymore. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? That's synergy. He did this for me. I won't go back to being what I used to be. I won't go back to that old life. I don't desire it. I'm, I'm, I can be free from it because of what He's done for me. So, to our role then, um, Holy Spirit's the primary cause, as I said, and you can read this, um, what God does for us by His Spirit and sanctification, how He empowers it, but He's not the only one. Again, this goes to the synergy. We have a role. Here's something that uh, probably my favorite theologian, at least modern one, Packer, says, sanctification is synergistic. It's an ongoing cooperative process in which regenerate persons alive to God and freed from sin's dominion are required to exert themselves in sustained obedience. 
How are you going to become more Christ-like if you don't work at being obedient to Christ? You won't. You can't. And in fact, if you belong to Him, if you're in union with Him, He won't let you stay in that state. He will discipline those that He loves for restoration. God's method of sanctification is neither activism. In other words, hey, try really hard. Um, I did my part, and I'll see you on the other side. Do your best. That's not what this is. But it's not apathy. It's not let go and let God. It's God-dependent effort. If you want one takeaway line, which I think is probably most valuable, it's Packer's line there. This is what sanctification is. It's God, it's God-dependent effort. And that's why I think this verse is so critical. This is the one I began with, Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Obedience is the means by which I work out my salvation. That, that's the connecting line there. As you've always obeyed, keep obeying. In obeying God, you're working out your salvation. Jesus says, um, I, let, me, let me back up a little bit. I saw this clip on, uh, I don't remember, it was Twitter or Instagram the other day. It was a, it was a young woman who um, is an OnlyFans model. If you don't know what that is, don't go exploring it. Um, I don't know what sort of account she has or you know w- what level of nudity, pornography she puts on her account, OnlyFans account. And she was making a statement, you know, I love Jesus. I, I love Jesus. And I know that Jesus loves me and that he understands. And, and I think he's fine with me having this OnlyFans account. Well, not only is that just absolutely preposterous and God forbid what sort of teaching she's received and what sort of gospel she was given, if you love Jesus, the Bible couldn't be clearer about how you demonstrate that. If you love me, you will do what I say. You will keep my commandments. So the obedience, again, look at the picture here. Okay, you're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, fear, honor, respect, that I would disregard the will of God, that I would disobey the Almighty. That's the work of a Christian. Like, man, this is my new life. He's my new king. I'm going to honor King Jesus. I'm going to work out with fear and trembling because... God is working in me. And how is God working in me? This is, this is critical. I mean, this is like one of my favorite passages. I think it's just so instructional. How does God work in us? In these two ways. To will and to work. Desire and ability. It's the mark of a new Christian. It's the mark of the new life. I think of a theologian far more uh, profound than I am where you're like Jonathan Edwards. He would tell you that that is the defining mark of regeneration that you really have a new heart, that you are in fact justified, that the work of God in you is giving you different desires than you ever had, set, setting you free from the bondage to the old desires. We talk about you know, the freedom of man and, and our free will and all those things. No, no, before Christ, your will was corrupted and enslaved and bent only towards sin and self-destruction. Your will has been liberated in Christ. Now you can will that which is good, that which is right, that which is pleasant, that which is beneficial, that which is godly, and the ability to carry it out. Will and desire, that's, that's what sanctification is. And then, of course, sanctification is not just private. And that's what that whole next section is about. If you want to summarize it, sanctification is not private and personal alone. Sanctification is, is collective. There's a reason for the church, or many, this is one of them. We actually are partners in each other's sanctification. That's why you're in a small group. Um, that's why you disciple one another. That's why you have an accountability partner. Um, that, that's why even what, maybe more casually or informally, um, when you know somebody's fallen into sin, you step in. You try to lift them out. This is why we correct error. This is why we encourage people to return to the Lord. This, you, you see what I'm saying? We do this together. Let me give you an example real quick on two of the Scriptures there. Look at those last two, Hebrews 4. In Hebrews, you know, we got these challenging passages about not falling away, not apostatizing. And so in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, While the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Okay, so you catch the sense of it? I don't want, I don't want any one of you to fall away. I, I, I want you to be, I want you to finish well. I want you to be sanctified. Any one of you. It's personal. But look at verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter in that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Do you see the connection there? 
I don't want you to fall, but you know what? Let's make sure together that none of us do. Let's all be working towards sanctification. And then again, as I said in conclusion, sanctification is one of those already not yet aspects of our salvation. We have been. It's definitive in time. Um, we are being right now. You are. And, you know, if, if sanctification was a, was a graph, you know, if your life was a graph of sanctification, it probably looks a little bit like this. You know, or someone else's may look like this. You may know somebody who's like this right now. It's not predictable. It doesn't run the same sort of pattern. Uh, we don't know how, how long and how far people will, will fall away from the Lord and, and what that will look like in God restoring them. But He will sanctify us. We are being sanctified, and we will be sanctified. And I think the final two maybe implications of that are this. We can give God the glory for that. He's going to finish this. He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. That's His promise. I mean, that, so when you feel like you're struggling or, you know, maybe you're worried or not, maybe you're concerned, you know, hurting a little bit for somebody that you care about, a family member, a, a son or a daughter, that you know they're a believer, but yet their life is just you know, what they're doing right now, how they're living is not showing evidence of that. Be confident in the promise of God that what He began, He will finish. I mean, we know that these things work together for good. Why? Because God who did this before time began promises He'll do this for all time and all the points in between. And that also gives us encouragement too. It gives us encouragement. This, this, this does end well for us. Um, that's a certainty. It, it may be a, a rocky path on the way to getting there, but it does end well for us um, for sure. So uh, that's where we are this week. we got two more. Um, we'll finish with glorification in two weeks, but we're going to hit these last two, and I think these are, this might be the most challenging ones we've looked at next, because I think this one is where our theology gets a little wonky and, and pretty shallow. So we're going to talk about the twin sides of probably the same effect, um, our responsibility and the work of God in both um, preservation, that's God's, and perseverance, that's us. So how do we know that we make it. What does it look like? What does the Bible call us to do in terms of preservation and perseverance, finishing well, that those who endure to the end, those who finish well, those are the ones who will be saved. What does the Bible teach about preservation and perseverance? And then we'll wrap up with uh, glorification at the end. Any questions tonight? we got like one minute to ask any question. For time's sake. Dan, you don't qualify. You have to ask me in private. No, go ahead. I think in essence they're the same thing. I think there are different ways of describing the same effect that in that moment we have been granted righteousness. We are set apart from this world. I think you know it's it's a different way of describing the same effect. So I think like if we describe that definitive sanctification, we're saying, okay, I was this, but now I'm this. I was in the kingdom of darkness, now I'm in the kingdom of light. I was under the dominion of Satan, now I'm under the kingdom of Christ. That set apart, been made holy, sanctification. But why? Because I've been forgiven, because I'm because I'm justified. So it's a, I think it's a different way of kind of looking at the same animal, the same event, the same thing. Um, but and the only reason I use that term, I, not so it'd be confusing for us, but because that's the way Scripture uses the term sanctification. And I hope that makes sense. So Dan's question is valid. I think it's the same thing, but because Scripture often uses the term sanctification in a definitive sense, you have been and it uses it in a progressive sense, and it uses it in a final sense, you know, you got to use the word. For our own understanding, I think probably justification, regeneration, that new birth, um, that's what we're talking about there. But the effect of that is sanctification. I'm out of that old world. I'm out of that old life. I won't be back in it. I've been delivered. I've been rescued. I'm in His hands. That's definitive sanctification. Any other questions? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for our great salvation. Um, everything that we see and study, I, I pray, will for each of us result in the glory of your name, to the praise of your glory. And um, Father, I pray also that not only will we understand you better, but we'll worship you more passionately, more deeply, because of what we understand of your salvation. We'll be more confident in you, um, and we'll be more confident to tell others about you. And Lord, that we'll rest in, in peace. We can lay our heads down on a pillow tonight knowing that we go to bed in Christ and we will awaken tomorrow in Christ. And so um, 
we give you the credit for all that, Father, for what you've done to save us, the work of your Spirit, the work of your Son, and our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.